Welcome to Graphic Policy Radio. This is your host, Ilana Levin, and this is a comics podcast. We're the sort of comics podcast that loves comics, from superheroes to noir to sci-fi mermaids. And that's why I'm joined by today's guest. Elsa Charretier is a comic book artist and writer, self-taught and debuting on Cowl at Image Comics in 2014. She co-created the award-winning Infinite Loop comic book series with Perry Colignette, Since then, she has been dividing her time between creating new creator-owned books like Super Freaks and drawing established characters. Clients include Random House, including George R.R. Martin's Windhaven graphic novel, DC Comics like Harley Quinn and Starfire, Marvel Comics' The Unstoppable Wasp, Lucasfilm, IDW Publishing, Disney, and New York Magazine. She is currently working on November with Matt Fraction. Elsa lives in the south of France. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for reaching out. I've, I've been a fan of your art for a long time, and, and nothing quite gets me as excited as when somebody contacts me and says, hey, I, want, I like your podcast, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I always like to start with folks. So how, did you get, how did you start uh, as, an, as an artist? How did you start drawing as, uh, as a young person and then building that into a, specifically uh, as a cartoonist, an illustrator? Yeah, so um, I didn't I didn't really draw when I was you know a teenager. I draw as a kid, like all, mm-hmm. all kids do, I guess. And uh, mm-hmm. I think I, I stopped about when I was about ten. Uh, I don't know. I kind of lost interest in it, and you know, uh, you're becoming a teenager and you want to be cool, and <laughs> that's a, <laughs> yeah. And drawing can be the sort of stuff that you forget that you love. So I stopped drawing for a long time. And uh, I was not planning on becoming a cartoonist at all. I wanted to work in movies. I wanted to be an actress. Mm. Um, and so I did that. I tried rather than did, but I really, really tried for, for a few years until I was about 24, um, where when I just realized uh, that it wasn't a life for me at all and I actually didn't like acting. Uh, and so at that time I discovered comics and, uh, and I started drawing again. So wow. yeah, I, I, I started late compared, compared to most artists. What comics did you get into when you were starting to get into comics? Um, so the thing is the whole story is my partner, uh, he's a writer, that's Pierrick. Mm-hmm. And he, at that time wanted to write for TV and he wasn't happy either and he discovered comics and he kind of tried to introduce me to it um mostly superheroes first and i wasn't really into it uh i don't know it didn't it didn't click with me at first and but he introduced me to watchmen and that's the first time uh after reading a comics that i thought ah oh, there's so much more to this medium than uh, what I thought, you know? And, yeah. uh, and so after reading that, uh, and I was still not into drawing yet at all. And, and my idea was absolutely not to do, to start a career in comics. It was just discovering a new, a new passion, if you want. And uh, around that time, Pierrick wanted to, um, decided to make the shift from writing TV to writing comics. But alone, I wasn't part of it at all. And he um, he met Charlie Adlard, who is the co-creator of The Walking Dead, uh, mm. back in Paris about seven or eight years ago. And uh, he wanted to pitch him something, you know, to have um, thoughts and advice because he was just uh, starting out. And Charlie said, yeah, yeah, just... Uh, send me a pitch and send me your stuff. And, and Pierrick asked me to, you know, draw some pages and see if I could actually, you know, like it and if I could do it. And so, um, I started drawing and, and we went to see Charlie with a, with a really terrible pitch and awfully drawing, uh, pages, but Charlie was really nice and he encouraged us and, um, what was something for fun, you know, for me, something for me to do just became a passion in a career. Wow. So it's Talk totally about jumping random, in the deep end. You know? <laughs> Sorry, what's that? 
So talk about jumping right into the deep end of working on something. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so from the moment that he asked me if I, because he didn't have anything else, anyone else to, to draw his story. He didn't know any artists back then at all. So he kind of, I was just sitting next to him, <laughs> the easiest person to ask. And, uh, and he asked me and the, of course I got maybe two weeks, I think to, to work on five pages and, I hadn't drawn anything in a very, very, very long time. So it wasn't good at all. Uh, but I did the pages and we lettered them. And uh, yeah, we, we, we did it. It wasn't good, but uh, we did it. Wow. That's just so ambitious and amazing. <laughs> I, especially because with comics, like there's so many different things that come into drawing them. There's literally like, how are you drawing a figure, a face, and then there's the layer of like, how are you breaking that down the action into individual panels? And that mm. second part is just so not something that you really do when you're a little kid, generally speaking, even if you are a kid who's a really good artist in terms of making a pretty picture. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a skill that is unique to comics and it's, it's not easy. Drawing itself is really hard. And after yeah. drawing for seven or eight years, um, I can feel that it's easier now, but there are some things, you know, to get to that next level that are really, really hard to to achieve. And it takes a long time after a while. Um, but the storytelling part is really hard in itself. Yeah. Yeah. Was your, was your uh, background in film part of helping you figure out how to work that aspect? No, uh, not the storytelling part. It was a huge mm. help when it comes to uh, gesture and, you know, oh. expressions and, and how to convey feelings. Um, so my background in acting was a huge help. Uh, That's so interesting. I, I totally get that. And I don't know if that I've ever heard anybody express that before. <laughs> That's really cool. It's and, also and I interesting think that, to me. Sorry, go ahead. It's also interesting to me that you guys got into comics through American comics when France has its own, you know, comics world and comics, uh, you know, comic books that are, mm -hmm. you know, very much uniquely French and that are just very distinct from like the American sort of image comics, DC, Marvel kind of thing that's so ubiquitous in the States. It's very different on, on all the levels, the production, the, the, the relationship between artists and publishers and editors very different too uh and of course the books you know the format of the books how many pages uh so how it works in france is an artist will usually have one or two books out a year and the books are generally 64 pages so that's not a lot of pages a year but the pages are more complex um more details more panels um, so it's a really a different way of working, a different rhythm. And um, very, very early on, I r knew that working in France and working that way wasn't going to do it for me, you know. Uh, and also I, I like, I enjoy the independence that you get as an artist in the States. Whereas mm. in France, it's, you really, you have a, a publisher and within that publisher, you'll have one editor. And usually you'll do your entire ent entire career with that one person. And I find that as a freelancer, extremely bad because it's like putting all your eggs in one basket. Yeah. And I've, I've, had, I've heard stories of, you know, artists and good artists that didn't get any job after their editors retired you know that's ridiculous <laughs> but that's wow, how it that... works here and it can be seen um really badly to try and uh you know seduce another publisher <laughs> to try and work with someone else and expand your um uh, your uh connections and you know network and i i really don't agree with you know with the uh, how artists, generally speaking, in France are treated by publishers. You know, I, I didn't think there could be a system that I disliked more than the American one, but I think that there are huge problems with the French one. I had oh, no idea about that. There are huge problems. And uh, 
I don't know the, you know, I don't know it very much because I, I never worked with a French publisher ever. Mm. Um, but I have friends who work in the market and the, the right. money is absolutely awful here. Um, 80% of French artists are living below the poverty line. Mm -hmm. So the French market exists solely because artists have uh, partners that have, you know, a regular job. Right. I mean, I think that's largely the case here too, but I also don't think that like, if your if your editor dies or retires, like you'll, that's not like the, the end yeah. of the line. Uh, but that's like crazy. It, it's, it's the case because in the States, there are lots and lots of artists. So it can be hard to, you know, dig your path. But once you start working, you can make a living. I mean, the, mm. the page rates are pretty good uh, considering it used to be better, of course, but it's okay. In France, you can divide that by five or even 10 sometimes. Wow. Yeah. Ah. So you can be, you can have a book that sells like crazy in France and still not make very much. Well, I hope American publishers don't know because if they think they can get away with making things even worse for people, they probably will. Mm, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so keep that under your hat, listeners. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, but it's true that you are someone who's worked with a really wide variety of writers and in di so many different genres. Um, when, when you reached out to me about November, uh, which is the new graphic novel series that you're working on with Matt Fraction, with... Um, uh, the uh, uh, Matt Hollingsworth on color and Kurt Anke on letters and Ryan Hughes on design. And he's like the designer, right? For yep. so many cool books. Yeah. Um, I was like, this is so different from the other work I've seen from you. Cause I I'd seen your work on unstoppable wasp. Uh, I'm friends with Jeremy Whitley. And that book is such a really wonderful, exciting and like all ages. I mean, like, you know, project. And then this mm -hmm. is really a hard boiled you know, gritty noir story. It's very different from the other stuff. Um, it is. And it's a conscientious uh, choice, you know. Um, mm -hmm. When I started working out, working in comics, um, I was younger. And I liked maybe lighter things, subjects and, and art that was um, a bit more pulpy and uh, um, full of life and enthusiasm. And that's what I liked. And mm. you know how, how it is when you're, uh, quotation mark, known for something? Because I wasn't known for something, but editors knew my work, um, right. knew the kind of work that I did. You get, you get uh, hired to do that work. And that's, I mean, that's good. But after a while, you can, you can be trapped as an artist. You know, I maybe wanted to do other stuff, um, more greedy stuff, more noir um, hard boiled, like you said, mm -hmm. and editors probably wouldn't think of me for projects like that. So the only way that you can make that shift is doing your own thing. And after that, you print a new image, you know, a new, a new version of yourself as an artist. And maybe now mm -hmm. publishers would hire me for, for that stuff. But yeah, I had to say, okay, um, I may be offered some great projects for either Marvel or DC or or Archie or and, and books that I know I would have fun working on, but I need to do something that is really, really different and it, I'm going to have to do it with, you know, Matt <laughs> because I really <laughs> wanted to work with him, but something that would go through image. This is definitely a very different book for Matt Fraction as well, right? Yeah. Like I, maybe I'm just thinking about the ones of the books of his that I really love, and I'm a huge fan of his work. Um, but this definitely was not what I expected from from him either. He's know? known as the funny guy, you know. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but he and he's great at that. I mean, uh, yeah. the, the his latest uh, Jimmy Olsen's book is just, just hilarious. I love it. But he can do uh, yeah. really dramatic stuff as well. But you know that that humor still is still there. You know, it's it maybe it's a little more sarcastic, uh, mm -hmm. but it's still in at some at times November is funny, even though it's tragic. Right. You know, yeah, it's that very dark, bleak sense of humor in yeah. the book. 
So are, are you someone who's interested in noir in general? Were there films that you're inspired by or, or maybe other comics? I am, but I, I'm not very, you know, generally speaking, I'm not very not knowledgeable on things. I, I tend to do rather than theorize. So I couldn't talk to you about noir because I really mm. don't know much about it. I just know that visually it appeals to me. Uh, but right. I do, one of my favorite movies is Sunset Boulevard. So that yes. kind of gives you an idea of <laughs> the kind of noir that I like to do. I just watched that again recently, like a, just a couple weeks ago. Um, it is that's such so funny. a perfect movie from beginning to end. There's, it's, it, it's perfect. Uh, yeah. What, I mean, what, 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 what about it speaks so much to you? Um, I like that it's grandiose. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I like how um, I love shots that are constructed, you know, uh, I, I also like the naturalistic stuff. But when when you can see that everything in a shot has been carefully thought and planned and, and put there for a reason, whether it's, you know, production or lighting or, uh, you know, cinematography and all that stuff. I love what, when it's it feels tight, you know. And yes, I, yeah. um, a few days ago, I rewatched Seven Samurai and all the oh. Kurosawa movies have that in common. You know, the shots are absolutely perfect. And, uh, yeah, I think it, it, it shows in my work that I like, you know, to construct and build the, um, the sets and the panels. Yeah. But that's what, what I like about noir because movies uh, from that era used to be like that. And, and we kind of, s- cinema kind of, loosened up this past decades. Um, but I like the tightness of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely some of the reasons that it appeals to me as well. And it was also interesting for me to read November right now because the, uh, the non, the non comics fiction reading I'm doing is very much right now is very much in the noir genre as well. So I went from listening to the audiobook of LA Confidential to, oh. to reading November. And then earlier when I was reading the first volume of November, I was reading November. And then I was listening to the audiobook of The Big Nowhere, mm. both James Elroy books. And it was sort of an interesting um combination of of things to be to of art to be consuming at the same time. Yeah, I can see how, you know, on some levels uh we share, you know, influences and um, and uh, one one other genre that I love from that era, also the sixties and the fifties mm-hmm. and the, and the sixties, um, is all the um, you know the um, gangster uh, books from um, I'm blanking the name of that really really uh, the um, Friends of Eddie Coyle. What's the writer? Uh, oh, I'm blanking that. He's very famous. Uh, George Higgins. Um, oh, okay, cool. Uh, and Elmo Leonard too, and I love those books. It's a bit more gangster than November mm-hmm. is, but there is still that yeah. co- noir component. Yeah, definitely. I'm I, 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 I'm I'm Elmo Leonard fan as well. Do you the, you know one of the characters in November? Like you have three people from very different places in their life and in their world, and and one of them you have is a a desk cop. Like basically, she's a dispatcher, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't know that I've seen a comic with that as one of the main characters. Yeah. Like, ever. You know, it's it's one of the things that Matt does so well. He will show you the characters that no one will talk about. You know, yeah. uh, he he uh, he works on, you know, the small stories. Well, that, that one is rather big. But, you know, the characters that mm-hmm. you would see in the background, that's who we, he would write. And you're right in saying that who would choose a dispatcher as their main character? You know, you'll go for the hero, the, the cop, or, and uh, in our story, the cops are the bad guys. Yeah, uh, very, very much so. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the other main characters is Dee, and, and she's a former waitress. She uses crutches. She's a, a pigeon. Um, I, as a New Yorker, I should know the right term, but a pigeon hobbyist, I guess. Um, yeah, I don't know the exact word. Uh, yeah, she has a coop. <laughs> That's yes, the word the, I know. A, the keep, a keeper of a pigeon coop. Yep. Um, and there's a lot of imagery around flying with her. And then you have the other woman, 
um, who's from the suburbs, who has the, you have the flashback of her with the kite uh, it's growing M. up. M, thank you. M yes. Rose. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, it's, and those it's are some all of the about big symbols. characters being trapped in, in D with her pigeons. It's a, it's a metaphor that is quite literal. Uh, they are uh, trapped in the pigeon coop and she'll go up uh, it, uh, in the roof and will open it and just sh- they'll fly away and that's you know that's her escape because she is trapped too because of the city because of the money that she makes that that is illegal and she and that she can't use uh, so there's the imagery of you know the cross wires definitely yeah. you uh, you know uh, is here to um, to reinforce what we're saying about freedom and the absence of it. Yeah. Yeah. And your drawing style is definitely really different in the book than it is in your other work, but I could also recognize it, right? Like there's particular proportions of some of the faces that are in line with, you know, how I, you know, you have a very heart shaped face that you draw for a lot of female characters. And like, that sort of is like, okay, yeah, like this is coming from the same Mm -hmm. creator as, um, as you know, infinite loop and or as yep. unstoppable wasp, but the 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 way that you're holding the pen and the pen lines is so much thicker and and inkier. Well, one thing that uh, that will give you the impression uh, that it's thicker and you know a bit toothier is I inked on paper um, rather than you know digital. The, the past the past um, the last years I worked. Uh, digital I inked digitally mm-hmm. and so that will give you that uh, smoother uh, cleaner lines which is fine but and mm-hmm. I enjoyed it and it's more it feels maybe more animated but for November we needed a you know a tools or a technique that would um, work with the city and it's a dirty city it's it's all gritty it's raining all the time people and are unhappy so the lines shouldn't convey joy um yeah so so there's that and when you when you talk about the fact that the faces are pretty similar and it's more uh the rest of it of my art that changed that changed more it's also because when the shapes are really important in how a a drawing looks and superhero shapes are very special in particular because they're, you know, skin tight and you'll see the body of whoever is right, is, uh, is um, wearing the, the suit. Whereas everyday people don't wear that, that tight yeah. clothes. So the shapes uh, will be very different. And even though you, I would have used the exact same style, just switching that to a more, you know, uh, everyday environment would look very different just with the shapes but I also mm-hmm. I also worked on you know other things but this is a, a, a big thing a big difference between those two yeah yeah and you're having working with I mean, you know a much more limited palette although that's obviously something which is happening in conjunction with uh the you know the colorist who's who's doing that yeah how do you work with a colorist on a book like this actually uh, um, I'm some some colors I worked with would say I'm I'm not easy, and others would say I am easy. So I don't know. Um, I don't always know what I want, but I definitely know what I don't want. And sometimes it happen it happens rarely, but it happens. Um, it doesn't work. And it's and when it doesn't work, it's really hard to you know work to something that would satisfy both me myself and the colorist. But for Matt, I have like virtually no notes ever. Uh, the palettes that he uh, chooses for each scenes and volume two in that way is just incredible. He makes some color choices that are you know really weird. And and definitely something that you wouldn't think to do, think to do, uh, but they work so well. And he his coloring, um, he's a huge part of how the book is today. And you know, he's a really important part of the process. Without Matt's coloring, 
the book would look totally different. And it, it informed my art too, because I knew what he would do. Uh, because by now we have been working together for quite some time. Um, mm. So we work really well together. That's really cool. Yeah, I could definitely see that. Um, and it's interesting also because like, I could have seen a version of November that would have been just entirely grayscale. Oh, yeah, I think it would work, definitely. And he's worked with, you know, it's, entire, it's entirely colored in flats. So it wouldn't be too hard to do a black and white version, I think. That's interesting. Yeah, I'm, you know, and it's really atmospheric and and yeah, I've just been it's been really cool to to be able to see your work in that kind of a light. Um and I want to talk about some of the other projects you've done, um including The Unstoppable Wasp. Uh mm-hmm. like I said, I'm a I'm a big fan of, of Jeremy Whitley and um in that book you got to introduce it's a, you know, a superhero book for Marvel in case anybody is like unclear on this starting Nadia Pym and she's a young teen superhero and there's a lot of focus on young women in science um, and mentorships between the grown-up Janet Pym and Nadia Pym. And um, what was, uh, in, in, in Unstoppable Wasp, you got to create a team of young female characters um, visually. And uh, what, what is the process like of coming up with that many new characters? And each one of them is really unique in their visuals, which is something I really appreciate. Um. I'll be honest and I will tell you that I do not remember the process of designing those characters because I have a terrible memory and I forget absolutely everything. But generally speaking, uh, when it comes to coming up with characters, um, I and I'm not a character designer. So I know Mm. that some people uh, are way better at it, uh, but I... I, I, I will have to draw those characters. So one of the things that is really important is uh, being happy with the design because once you've introduced a character, you're kind of stuck with the design. So you better like it. Um, mm-hmm. And um, one of the basics of character design is the design of the character and their shape should reflect who they are, you know? And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, the basic example is, you know, uh, pointy shapes are a bit more aggressive. So you'll do someone with pointy hair. It's a bit more dynamic, aggressive. Some so shapes that are more round tend to be softer and, you know, nicer. Um, but what you want to do is not rely on those stereotypes or easy shortcuts and try to um, come up with new ways of designing character. And... Um, I don't usually work from actors or, you know, faces or from from photos, but I try to um, be organic and and think as little as possible. (laughs) Hmm. But my process uh, for designing characters uh, a few years ago compared to what it is now um, is very different. Um, I'm working on a pitch right now for what I hope will be my next book. And um, I've been very um, thoughtful and put a lot of uh, care into shapes and making sure that the characters are very different in their silhouettes. Uh, Because when you have a team, and I think that's one of the things that I could have done better on Wasp, for example, because I wasn't quite there yet, uh, is making sure that their shapes, even, even when if you were to, you know, black, black them out, entirely and just have the outline uh, were probably too similar and what I'm trying to do now is have very different and charismatic shapes that allows you to um, distinct one character from another really easily Hmm. and it has the benefit of also having a more diverse uh, types of bodies yes also I'm, I'm definitely guilty in the past of and and when you do superheroes, there are uh, you know we, we tend to 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 lean on the on the lean side for body types, um, and I'm, I'm I'm definitely guilty of having drawn too thin to thin women or young women, and uh, I'm I want to change that obviously because and also I think it was probably a, a drawing limitation, 
a technical mm. limitation. I didn't know how to really do that well. So I stuck to the thing that I knew I could I could do. But now that I'm right. more comfortable uh, and I know that I can, you know, uh, improvise and I'll figure out the solution, I'm more definitely more aware and careful in uh, body shapes and making sure that it's diverse and reflective of yeah. the people that are reading comics. That's awesome. I'm, 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 I'm really happy hearing that. And I would say that even from the start though, like the women in the, you know, the bodies you're drawing are at least like, they're always like, they all work in physics and they're not like hypersexualized teenagers. And mm. those are, that's always stuff that just drives me crazy. Yeah. And well, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> even from the start, you had that much down. So yeah. yeah. yeah the, um, I, I, and I really do really think that like all the characters have such good class clothing and different established looks and, um, you can, you know, you can really tell people's own style and that you've really thought about costume. I mean, clothing as costumes. Yeah, I, I tried. And it's, it's something that I'm, um, you know, it can, if you want a book to last in time, it's like, you know, those movies that you'll see that were done in the nineties and they have really bad references from that decade. And it, it the, they, you know, um, they don't, um, do well in time. And I'm very careful in coming up with uh, costumes for characters that work in the era that I'm drawing this thing, but will not be totally irrelevant and and seem, you know, old fashioned or ridiculous in 10 years. So there is a balance. Yeah. And, and that's how, to, how I choose to do things. But I know that uh, some artists draw very current thing, things in, in current styles and it, it works really really well um but how i like to do it is try to find a happy middle if you want and Mm -hmm. um one thing that is that helps is just drawing everyday clothes because a jacket regular jacket is not gonna look really weird in 10 years you know because jackets are pretty much the same now that they were um in in the 90s maybe less colored but (laughs) You know, it's trying to, you know, everyday clothes don't change too much. It's, it's high fashion changes, um, but not so much what people are wearing, uh, are wearing every day. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also very closely observed. Like you're definitely somebody who is, is capturing like what young people are wearing really. Well, I mean, look, I'm not that young, but from what I seem to know, this <laughs> is capturing what young people are wearing really well. Um, and then, you know, you've also been, you know, done real like fantasy stuff with like Star Wars and um, with George R. R. Martin's work as well. Like, mm-hmm. what, wh- how do you approach working on like science fiction visuals? And it, I mean, I know definitely it's different working in the Star Wars world than it is doing your own book, like Infinite, Infinite Loop. But yeah, um, um, but for Star Wars, it's, it's pretty easy really because you have a uh, Bibles of um, designs uh, and some stuff you have to use and others you can, you know, tweak and come up with your own stuff. But the, the Star Wars style is, is really well defined. So you want to make sure that you draw designs that are, uh, that make sense within that world. Uh, but for Infinite Loop, uh, Besides, besides the the storytelling and the squares and 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 what we did with the shapes of panels, it was a world that was not that you know not that sci-fi as we imagine it. Um, and I think mm. that maybe because I don't really know how to do that, <laughs> so I'll I'll do stuff that I'm familiar with. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm. I'm definitely, um, you know, envious of some artists who can just come up with stuff. You know, you give them a pen and they're like creating robots, and you know, and I'm, I, I, I'm really, I can't do that. So <laughs> I tend to focus on characters and mm-hmm. have, um, you know, some, uh, some, some designs that I tweak that will look more sci-fi. Uh, but generally speaking, I'm not very. Um, it's hard for me to come up with science fiction stuff. I don't know well, why, because I, defi- I, mm-hmm. I watch a lot of it, but <laughs> I don't know. 
it's, you know, the machines are just really different from people. I, yeah. I, know, I feel like that's a big piece of it. Too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's funny because I know uh, artists that, that draw Mika, Mika so well, but they don't know how to draw people. <laughs> so that's yeah. fair. It's really two uh, different skills. But that's well, I, why I definitely I'm... think your take on. Sorry, go ahead. As I say, I definitely think your take on Admiral Holdo's hair is like the best Admiral Holdo's hair. So it has such a beautiful, like, I don't know, like 1920s, 1930s, like look to how you shape it. So well, it's, you're definitely it's, uh, nailing that. It's, I took the, um, the, I think I got maybe a reference from her from one of the movies. Uh, I think that was it, or maybe from another comic. And I just stylized it, you know, make, uh, simplified the shapes. And that just makes it lo- look um, instantly more graphic and efficient. Yeah. I mean, it, and, but also just really beautiful. Like, I, you know, you're one of the artists who I just think your general aesthetic of how you like to draw things is really beautiful and just works for me, you know. Um, well, thanks. And, um, one thing that I uh, that I um, that I tried to do on November, because November's world is not supposed to be pretty, and yeah. when drawing comics, you know it's a st- it's a stylized world, and everything is supposed to be muscular and 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 pretty, and and that's a trap that I don't want to fall into, because that's not a, a view of society that I uh, that I share. Uh, you know, uh, I, mm-hmm. uh, society made it entirely of beautiful people doesn't interest me. So, but there are there is a way to find beauty and to come up with beauty in not so pretty. You know, and uh, if you look at the characters in November, M, I'd say is you know pretty, not gorgeous but pretty. But the other characters yeah. aren't, and I try to find beauty in the shapes. And not the faces th- themselves, you know, by uh, current mm-hmm. beauty standards, they are not. But they're beautiful to me because of how the shape work. Um, so, yeah, it's a shift also in that regard. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I, I'm sure it does make for a, a, a more interesting approach to drawing, period. Oh, yeah. Because uh, most of the time, beauty is very you know, uh, pure and simple and loose lines and it's fun to draw. It's nice to draw, but when you start adding details and, you know, volumes and that makes it more interesting to me. So thinking back to, gosh, I mean, I, well, Infinite Loop hit America in like what, 2015. I actually don't know when the work on that began in, in, in France, but you know, that was a, a book that you guys worked on just completely, you know, from, from the beginning and uh, very much like a science fiction work and story. Um, how, how did you develop the aesthetic for that when you had a pretty wide open um, um, world, you could, how? you could grow however you wanted. Um, it's been a while, so I don't exactly remember how I developed it, but most of it was, yeah. Oh, one thing I do remember, and it's it's changed just just recently, is that I didn't used to sketch stuff, which is weird. I I've never kept a sketchbook, and it's not good. <laughs> uh, but I think it's probably because I started working professionally right away. And I never really uh, had time to draw for fun. So I never kept a sketchbook. So most of the sci- sci-fi stuff that I came, uh, that I uh, that I used and, and draw uh, were things that I drew on the page. You know, I came up with them as I went. And that's limiting, I think, um, because I've recently learned and, uh, applied that sketching is a great way to figure out stuff. I mean, it's pretty obvious and uh, I should have realized that sooner. But um, so most of the things that I worked, the sci-fi stuff that I did on Infinite Loop were just, you know, spur of the moment. I didn't really uh, sing them through and that's fine. But 
if you keep doing that, you're at the risk of repeating yourself because you work with reflexes. Uh, so that's uh, why I decided to, you know, try something different now. But most of it on Infinite Loop was just spur of the moment inspiration. That's really interesting. I, it makes a lot of sense too. I I just pulled up an old copy of the Infinite Loop as we were talking as well. And I, I have to say the architecture you draw in it is so cool. So, I mean, buildings aren't meccas, but already, you know, that early in your work, you were drawing really interesting physical spaces. Thank you. Thank you. I, <laughs> I uh, The Infinite Loop has a really special place in my, in my heart because, you know, it's our first American book for, you know, the States and professional book, if you want. And, uh, but I cannot look at it. <laughs> I cannot, I cannot bear to look at those pages. Because it's too early. And so you can see all the stuff oh, you would yeah. do differently. If I you would did it now. do everything differently and hopefully better, <laughs> but no, I know that it's, uh, I think it's still a good book, but it's hard for me to look back at those pages. I mean, I definitely relate to that when it comes to listening to, you know, old episodes of the show or looking at old art that I did when I was younger, but I, I still think it looks so cool. Oh, you draw uh, too? I definitely, yeah. I'm sorry? You draw too? Well, it's complicated. Um, I, I'm actually getting back into it now, um, oh. but I don't try to do sequentials because that's a fucking nightmare. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know how you guys do it. And that was always a limitation for me. I could never do sequentials. Um but you but know, yeah. there's the whole, you know, the entire field of illustration doesn't require to work uh, in sequential, and it's it's great. That's true. I mean, and 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 you know, one of the things I I, I tend to use it for practical stuff, like I made my dad a birthday card, or oh. we needed to have a non what's it, a non like hyper stereotypical illustration of a gender diverse family for an ad we were running, um, for immigrant rights. Mm -hmm. So and we weren't finding any, um, uh, what's it called? Um, we weren't finding any like clip art or whatever that like mm -hmm. actually met the needs. So I was like, screw it. I'm doing it. Ah. But, um, That's I, great. uh, but yeah, I, thank you. <laughs> I guess it's one of the things I'm hoping I can spend a little bit more time on now, but, um, but yeah, I like, I, I just definitely, you know, immediately right off the bat, like remember, you know, seeing your book and really appreciating the aesthetic uh, that Thank you, you. Would, that you were doing. Like, so who are some of the visual influences that you draw from? Sure. Um, so the obvious inference, early inference for me is Darwin Cook, whose work I discovered halfway through drawing the infinite loop. And when mm -hmm. I discovered his work, I, it was, I was, you know, uh, immediately drawn to it because it was what I wanted to do, but much, much better. Uh, <laughs> and I loved how, how, uh, how incredible, incredibly expressive his characters were, despite them very, being very simplistic, you know, uh, mm -hmm. be able to do so much with so little, uh, was, uh, you know, because when you start out, you always think that, okay, if I add this, this and that you know the, the drawing will be better but that's not true uh and so having that mastery of the exact line that is needed for the for the for the drawing um impressed me and still does um and i have a lot of different inferences and very different things um i'm a huge fan of eduardo riso too that I tried uh, him and uh, David Mezzucelli's uh, Bat Batman Year One work. I tried uh -huh. to channel into November. Those were the two oh. biggest influences for the book. Um, and uh, and I I know I have done some more influences, but I'm coming up short. But those are the three main influences in my work. I, I don't know Riso's work as well as I should, but I do know Mazzuccelli because I'm like a big Daredevil fan. And I definitely see that in, in what you worked on in November. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. uh, Riso's work, um, what I like the most about it, 
is his um, work with black, black and white and how he works with shadows. It's very specific to, to him and uh, it's incredible. Hmm. Have you done anything that was working in just a black and white palette? I don't, I don't know if you have. Nope. Never. Interesting. Um, I always count on colors to make it better. <laughs> uh, well, if, if, I, I think your work would look really cool in black and white. So maybe we'll, with, maybe we'll see that. Uh, we've, you know, toyed with the idea of doing a, an inked version of November mm. when, when all the volumes are out. Uh, we'll see if the sales are good enough and we'll try to maybe do that. That, that could be, that could be cool. You know, an oversized edition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's neat. Oh, that's neat. We'll see, but that's in the year. Well, one of the other books um, I read uh, when I was looking through, um, like whenever I have an artist on, you know, I have a sense of what are the works that they've done that I've known that I'm familiar with, but I always like to go and see if there's anything that slipped through the cracks. Mm -hmm. And I had not seen your work on the bombshells for DC Comics bombshells um, annual uh, from not so long ago. And uh, I I really love the way your the character designs you did for um, a retro uh, pin uppy vampire. Batgirl and um, a uh, the Enchantress and Ravager. Um, it's a sort of make a new Suicide Squad. Um, so I should almost give like credits to the artists uh, because I did not come up with those designs. Uh, oh. I, I drew them, but it wasn't me. I got references, and uh, the designs were from a bunch of different artists, and I don't know who uh did them i can't remember i used to know it but i can't remember but it's a bunch of different artists who did the design so i'm not responsible for it but you're absolutely oh. right in the in in <laughs> they are very, very 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 good and uh great to draw and fun you know visually speaking mm -hmm. they're fun and whoever did the inks on that, I need to look that up. Shoot. Um, whoever did the inks on that, like, I think that's a really good inker for you. The inks on Bombshell? Mm -hmm. That's me. I, I always I ink my own work and it will just... Well, work. hell yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about that, actually. You know, most artists aren't inking their own work. Um, Is, uh, really? Is that still the case now? That is still the case. I Even like when somebody is a famous anchor, like famous as an anchor, they are often passing off the inks to somebody different. Um, hmm. uh, yeah, I was, I was just well, interviewing maybe, Jerry maybe Ordway on the show. Maybe Marvel, maybe, um, probably like, you, you, like you're saying, but uh, I'm reading less and less of books, you know, licensed books from, from DC and Marvel. So that's why I, 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 I thought things were different. Um, but... I don't know. It's a different way of working. I wouldn't say it's um, better or, you know, less good. Yeah, it's it's just, you know, uh, Greg Capullo, whose work I yes. really, really like, doesn't ink himself because um, if you look at those pencils, <laughs> there is no way that he could meet, well, I don't think, uh, but that mm -hmm. would probably really be really hard to, to hit a monthly deadline inking his pages. Yeah, I mean, so much of it has to do with the system of, of producing a lot of work all yeah. at once. Uh, which I'm uh, less and less uh, drawn to. <laughs> uh, I've moved, um, you know, slowly but surely uh, toward a publishing system and publishing, you know, circumstances that that allow me to take more time, you know, to find my own yeah. rhythm. I mean, I think what's one of the big problems in art, comics art, is that too often, like I can, I can almost sense what an artist would have done if they'd been given enough time to actually do something right and see like what pieces might be missing when I look at it, you know? There are some artists who do monthly titles because even though you're working through image, you still most of the time have to meet uh, the monthly schedule. Uh, mm -hmm. But there are artists who do incredible stuff and really inventive stuff in 
in a monthly schedule. So it's incredible. I mean, the, the American artists are extremely fast or artists that are working for the American market, I should say. Mm-hmm. Um, but I found, I've realized, and that's the, that goes to what I was saying earlier, is that you can, or at least for me, I can draw really, really fast. And I used to draw two books a month. So it was, you know, crazy. I was drawing 40 pages a month. But Jesus. I could not come up with new stuff. You know, you have to keep repeating. Um, you cannot come up, or I couldn't come up with new ideas working that fast. Uh, because, you know, you have to churn out pages. Um, so, and... Um, for example, this morning I was working on on an illustration for a project that I'm pitching and I did the layout and I was happy with the layout and I figured, okay, this is going to take me maybe 30 minutes to ink, uh, an hour to color and okay. But then I decided, okay, maybe I should just stay the, take the entire morning and see how I could, you know, improve that and come up with different shapes and different way of doing things. And I ended up spending four hours just on pencils and moving stuff around and, and it's much, much better, you know, and it's different. I've, it doesn't look, it it looks like my style, but it doesn't look like a a panel or a composition that I used a dozen times before. It's different. And, um, I needed those extra hours to come up with something new. And in monthly comics, you really, really get get that chance to, uh, you know, try to do different stuff. And some artists are excellent at coming up with new stuff on the fly, and I'm I'm not, so I need the extra time. Uh, so that's why moving to a slow slow schedule would probably be good for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I know it's not true for everyone. I, I don't want to, you know, cast a net and, <laughs> and say this is how it is. I know it's not, but for me, it is. Well, and it's good to be able to experiment with different approaches too. Definitely, and uh, and I was, you know, the the first years of professional work, you're trying to prove that you know you can be fast enough, you can be professional enough, and 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 try to get as much stuff out as possible so that people will start to recognize your work but after a while you can i think you can slow down a bit and try to in- reinvent yourself make sure you, that you're not doing the same things over and over again mm-hmm. and to that i think it's good to take a step back and um and try different approaches and that's what i've been doing for the past you know since we started november really uh this is not as important for me to have books out, you know, every every two months or so. They'll go out. Well, they they'll come out. Well, they'll come out, and they will be as 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 um, as good as possible, as good as I can make them. You know. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, have you thought at all about whether you'd ever want to do? you know, more work in maybe animation or do more spot illustration or, you know, do kinds of illustrative work beyond, beyond comics? Um, I, yeah, I've, I've been thinking about that for, for a little while, you know, branching out a bit. And, uh, and I think it could um, help me, you know, not cannibalizing, cannibalizing. Yeah. Um, my own work and uh, hmm. do different, really different things that are not storytelling, that requires different skills that could make my work eventually better. Uh, so yeah, but I don't really know how to, where to start. And uh, so I've been kind of putting this off, but it's on my mind. It's been on my mind for a while. Because I can definitely imagine a really gorgeous animated movie done in your style. Um, and, you know, DC does keep putting out more more animation. Um, that would be super cool. That would be fun. I would sure love that. But, I, yeah, I I wish I, I had studied animation. I would really like how to know. 
to know how, sorry, to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love animation. So working, you know, um, as an illustrator for, for an animated show would be really fun, I think. You know, one one of the other things, I, I'm, I'm not someone who's super knowledgeable about the the French comics industry, although I I've have a few friends who talk to me about it a bit and who've covered it more than I have, is that it seems like there's a longer history of, of people in France treating comics as a serious art form mm-hmm. um, than we've had in America. Do, does that shape sort of how you're regarded as an artist in France? Um, I think that... Uh... I've never had that feeling from American fans at all Mm -hmm. Um, because people that read comics value art. So um, I never, I never had that feeling, but it is true that in France comics are not seen as something for kids, you know? Yeah. It's for adults and kids, but not only for kids. But that has to do with how um, monthly comics were just things that you would read and then throw out. Um, so that's a cultural thing, I think. Uh, but I I wouldn't say there is much difference in that. That's interesting, yeah. I, I feel like American comics folks have a lot of thoughts about like the differences between the industries and how things have been taken seriously in, in France for longer than no. they have here. I mean, Americans have all, who's actually make and work in comics have always felt that way, but this is culture at large. So doesn't um, really have a history of that. No. And, um, uh, there are some American, uh, comics artists who worked for the French market and they have a distorted vision of it because they come in as Americans and they are not treated as French artists at all. They don't have the same contracts because no American artist would ever sign a French contract. That's how ridiculous they are. Uh, And they are paid much, much higher wages. So if an American artist tells you, oh, France is so much better. Yeah. For, for them, but not for, for Mm. the French artists, but, um, how, how, um, you know, unhealthy, however unhealthy the American market and distribution system is, it's not that much better in France. And I would say it's worse. Wow. That is heartbreaking. We we really need to be able to put it together, you know, get people to come together and develop better models, especially right now when you see what's happening with diamond distribution. Yeah. And um, so many people are uncertain about the future of work that they've been working on. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, but you, you know, know comics uh, are huge. Something like image doesn't exist mm-hmm. in France. That you can't do that. the The only way that you can do something independently is through crowdfunding. Uh, so that's a huge thing to have an image model. Mm-hmm. And we don't French artists don't have that. They are tied to their publishers for their books are tied to the publishers for 70 years after the artist's death. Wow. So that gives you an idea. Well, you know, the comics industry has definitely, you know, become more and more international in terms of people who work in the American comics industry, but who live in other countries. Like that's just been, you know, the case for, a, you know, for, for a long time and getting to be more and more so. Mm-hmm. Um, like, what what do you, how, how does it feel like be, living in another country, but like very much working in the American comics industry? I don't, you know, it's, I've, ne- I've done it for so long and it's the first real job I ever had. So it feels, you know, normal for me. Uh, and uh, I'm used to, you know, never meeting or really seeing the people that I work with. Um, But, um, and I think it's great that American publishers are more open to artists from abroad, you know, and who are bringing in new influences and our way to, you know, um, make the medium reinvent itself. I wish 
there'd be more uh, non-American writers, though. Because the writing so is a huge part of, you know, what a comics is, obviously. And um, having different perspectives... And when I say non-American, I'm, I guess I should say non-English speaking because there are a lot of Irish and, and, and uh, English writers. Mm -hmm. um, but people from different cultures that, that speak, who speak a, a good English could work as writers in the States, but that's not something that is um, easy at all. Uh, when we started out, a uh, few people told us, um, okay, you can maybe work in the States as an artist, but you'll never work as a writer in the States if you don't live there, if you haven't lived there for 20 years. So to that, I said, um, bullshit. And <laughs> I, I said, there's, you know, if you speak English, there is no reason. Um, you know, we live in a, in a world where basically the American culture is the culture of everyone else. So you yeah. can't really argue cultural differences especially when it comes to pop culture. Um, so I wish that there'd be more uh, diversity in writers. You know, that's important too. That is so true. It is really noticeable. And thank you for bringing that out. It's something we should talk about more. Um, especially because it's not like Americans don't write comics about things in other countries. Yeah. Like pretty often. Uh, often from very uninformed standpoints, whereas people around the world have been consuming American media like in a serious way forever. Mm. Yeah. Um. So that's, that's I think, something that would help the medium staying relevant. Yeah. Definitely. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to be, thank be you talking with me. you. Where can our listeners keep keep up with your work? Where's the best place for them to check out your new art and see your new projects? Um, so I've got a, obviously a Twitter and an Instagram, but I've also put out um, an art book a month ago, two months ago um, through Kickstarter. And the book is now available on my Etsy store. Ooh. So that's a good way Where to- Where is your you Etsy know, store? It's uh, You could just Google my name and Etsy and you'll find it very easily. It's a book that compiles lots of illustrations, commissions, and um, details of my process. I kind of I try to go in depth, you know, of how I think a piece, and you know, the different the thinking process that goes uh, when doing storytelling versus illustration. Um, and and it, it's pinned to your Twitter account as well. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You can you can get to that on my Twitter feed. So folks should be following you, which is how we actually connected. Um, yeah, I'm at, on Twitter. On Twitter, which is at E underscore C-H-A-R-R-E-T-I-E-R. -R -E -E That's it. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you And so thank much. you to our listeners. Remember, this is Graphic Policy Radio. We are a podcast and we are associated with graphicpolicy.com, which is a fabulous comics website for news and reviews. And uh, you would, should subscribe to us on Spotify, on iTunes, wherever fine podcasts are listened to. And please give us some reviews. I would love to get more feedback. And you can always reach out to me on Twitter at E-L-A-N-A -A underscore Brooklyn. That's Ilana underscore Brooklyn. I would love to hear from you. And as we always say, keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.